Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the first lecture of the subject business law Today's lecture is introduction to contract and essentials of a valid contract part 1 I am Dr Rama Bansal working as assistant professor in Arya College Ludhiana This project is sponsored by DTH Swayamprabha MHRD New Delhi Today we are going to discuss the topics introduction to indian contract act 1872 meaning and definition of contract elements of contract kinds of contract essentials of a valid contract under which we will discuss offer and acceptance and legal relationship before knowing about indian contract act 1872 it's important to know what the subject is the subject includes two words one is business second one is law what is law law is the rules and principles of some action when we talk about the business laws it means business laws is a branch of law which relates to the business it comprises of sales of goods act it comprises partnership act as well as indian contract act 1872 etc When we talk about the Indian Contract Act 1872 this act came into force from September 1 1872 it is applicable at present to whole of India including Jammu and Kashmir but before that before the passing of the Jammu and Kashmir uh, reorganization act 2019 this act was applicable to whole of India except the Jammu and Kashmir and the passing of the act jammu and kashmir reorganization 2019 uh, makes it, it uh, makes it mandatory that uh, the subsection 2 of section 1 which states that excluding the state of jammu and kashmir the word excluding should be omitted from there this act indian contract act 1872 is now applicable to whole of india including the ut of jammu and kashmir This act is being divided into two parts. The first part includes the general principle. General principle which includes all type of contracts irrespective of their nature. Special contract which covers from section 124 to 238 deals with the contract of indemnity, deals with the contract of bailment, pledge and agency. And moreover this act is not exhaustive which means that it does not provide provide rules for the other contracts like sales of goods act partnership act etc now uh, what is the meaning of contract contract is an agreement to do or not to do an act and which is legally binding agreement section 2h of indian contract act 1872 even defines a contract as an agreement which is enforceable at law Similarly Halsbury also defines the contract he given the definition as we can read the an agreement between two and more persons which is intended to be enforceable at law and is constituted by the acceptance by one party of an offer made to him by the other party to do or to abstain from doing some act basically contract includes two elements one is an agreement second is it should be enforceable at law what is an agreement agreement is a combination again combination of two words that is offer and acceptance section 2 subsection e of indian contract act 1872 defines the agreement as every promise or every set of promises forming the consideration for each other is known as agreement when we talk about the agreement it includes the plurality of the persons means there should be more than one person involved into an agreement second they should give their acceptance for the same terms they should understand the things in a same manner 
एंड सेकेंड पॉइंट अंडर दिस इज द एनफोर्सेबिलिटी एट लॉ एनफोर्सेबिलिटी एट लॉ मीन्स इट मस्ट गिव राइज टू द लीगल रिलेशनशिप देयर शुड बी सम लीगल बाइंडिंग only then the contract would be enforceable at law to discuss this we can discuss the case of welfare versus welfare under this case what happened uh, under this case what happened mr welfare was employed in ceylon and mrs welfare who have to accompany him to ceylon uh, due to her ill health she stayed in england and for that mr welfare said that he would give Uh, pound thirty to Mrs. Welfare for his uh, for her living. Then what happened? Uh, later on, initially Mr. Welfare was giving this pound thirty to Mrs. Welfare, but later on, uh, he he. Uh, but later on, he denied for it. He did not give pound thirty to Mrs. Welfare, and for this, Mrs. Welfare filed a suit. she said that mr welfare promised me that he would give pound 30 for my living but now mr welfare is denying for that and for this the court said that because this was totally a domestic agreement this was totally a domestic affair and it does not create any legal relationship between two person the intention was not legal relationship so in this case the court said that this case cannot be sued and mr welfare cannot be sued for pound 30 per month by mrs welfare this case clearly indicates that when there is no legal relationship the case the contract is not enforceable at law that means what we can say that when there is an agreement and it has the enforceability at law only then it is a contract next we come to the kinds of contract the contracts can be divided on three bases one on the basis of validity or enforceability second on the basis of formation and third on the basis of performance let's talk about the first category that is on the basis of validity or enforceability so under this there are valid contracts void contracts unenforceable contracts illegal agreements and voidable contracts so let's start with the valid contracts valid contracts are those contracts which are enforceable at law uh, let's take an example a offers to b to sell his car for rupees 30000 and b agrees for that and he pays rupees 30000 to to mr a so the contract is over because this includes all the essential elements of section 10 of indian contract act 1872 so this is a valid contract in short any contract any activity any contract which has all the essential elements of section 10 of this particular act would be counted as a valid contract second one is the void contract void contract are those contracts when they were entered they were valid but because of some supervening impossibility of performance now it is not possible to perform them they become void let's take an example uh, mr a from india and mr b from pakistan made a contract uh, mr a has to supply some goods to mr b in pakistan when this contract was made there was a peaceful situation among india and pakistan but when this contract is to be uh, matured at that time the war break up so that means now it is impossible to deliver the goods to pakistan from india so now you can see the situation when we had when mr a mr b had made the contract the contract was a valid contract but because of some intervening uh, impossible con condition now it is totally impossible to perform the contract and the contract became the void contract third we come to unenforceable contract what are unenforceable contract unenforceable contracts are those contracts be which because of some technical uh, defects can't be enforced 
for example uh, like in case of uh, property selling property purchasing they there should be some stamps necessary government stamps are necessary on those papers which are to be which are relating to the property but every other things every other thing involved in section 10 of indian contract act 1872 is available in the contract uh, available in the activity but due to some technical errors as i have given the example the example of stamping if stamping is missing in any uh, any paper where it is the mandatory part of the contract this contract cannot be enforced so these type of contracts are known as unenforceable contracts next we come to the illegal agreements illegal agreements are those agreements which are against the public policy which are not allowed by the law for example if there is a, a contract for decoity and if there is some contract of smoke uh, smuggling so these type of contracts are against the public policy and these are not allowed by the government so these type of contracts are known as illegal agreements these are void ab initio but here it's very important to differentiate between the void agreements and illegal agreements uh, for example contract with minor is a void agreement but it is not illegal whereas the contract of smuggling is a illegal agreement that means there is a difference both are void ab initio void ab initio means they are void from the first instance they are void from very beginning very initial but illegal agreements are against the public policy where are Uh, it is not necessary that the void agreements are against the public policy as i have given the example of contract with minor if any contract is done with minor it is not against public policy this is a void agreement this is not illegal there is a thin line of difference between the illegal agreements and the void agreements next we will discuss voidable contracts voidable contracts are those contracts which are at the option of the other party but not at the option of the others normally voidable contracts occur uh, in absence of the free consent let's take an example uh, if mr a is of weak mind then under the undue influence of mr b he said that he will sell his property to him for a very less price so that means here under uh, undue influence mr a has given his consent to sell the property and mr b has undue influence on a because of his weak mind so this contract would remain valid till it is repudiated by the party entitled to avoid it that is mr a but once mr a said that he is not willing to sell his property to b later on and it is being proved this contract would become the void contract that means in short voidable contracts are those contracts which are totally at the option of the party now the second category kind kinds of contract on the basis of formation under this the first contract is the express contracts express contracts are those contracts which are said in words either either by speaking or by written there is a very simple example of this mr a said to mr b that i want to sell my car to you and mr b accepts it this contract may be in the written form or this contract may be in the spoken word so this type of contract is known as the express contract second we come to the implied contract implied contracts are uh, always clear from the conduct or behavior of the other party these are smelled out of the surrounding circumstances and conduct of the parties for example when one person enters into a restaurant and orders a food that means there is a implied contract between the restaurant owner and the customer this type of contract are always shown by the conduct of the either of one party 
third type of contract is a quasi contract quasi contracts are those contracts in which initially there is no intention of making contract by either party let's take an example of the founder of the lost goods if someone find some goods on the road where the owner is unknown now it is the responsibility it is the duty of the founder of the lost goods to find the true owner of the goods and to return the goods to the true owner now there would be a relationship between the finder of lost goods and the owner of the uh, lost goods wherever there was no such contract no such intention between both of them to make any kind of contract last under this category is the e contracts e contracts are done on the internet normally people through uh, edi electronic data uh, interchange what the people do they just contact each other and finalize their terms and these type of contracts are known as e contracts now we come to the third category of the contracts that is on the basis of performance under this there are two categories executed contracts and executory contracts let's discuss the first one that is the executed contracts executed contracts are those contracts where both of the parties have performed their part where both of the party have completed their words for example uh, mr a offers offered to mr b to sell his house and mr b had uh, accepted that offer now mr b has paid to mr a and mr a has delivered the papers of property to mr b both the parties have performed their part so in this case this type of contract both the parties have performed their responsibility this contract is known as executed contracts next we come to the second category that is executory contracts so in the ex executory contracts either one party or both of the parties are yet to performed in the last example as i said mr a offered the house to mr b and mr b has accepted that now in the executory contracts either mr b has not paid or uh, and similarly mr a has not delivered the papers to mr b here both parties are left to perform or single party has left to perform Uh, like for example mr b has paid and mr a has yet to deliver the papers of property to mr b so that means either one party has performed or both uh, both parties are yet to perform these these kind of contracts are known as executory contracts that means in this way we can define that the contracts can be defined into three categories which we have discussed by now now we come to the essentials of a valid contract we have read about the contract but now it's important to know what is the valid contract section 10 of indian contract act 1872 provides the various points which makes a contract a valid contract among those the first one is the offer and acceptance legal relationship lawful consideration capacity of parties free consent lawful object certainty of meaning possibility of performance not declared to be void or illegal and legal formalities in this presentation in this chapter we will cover the first two so let's start with the first one that is offer and acceptance section 2 subsection a defines offer as when one person signifies to another his willingness to do or to abstain from doing anything with a view to obtaining the assent of that other to such act or assistance is called as an offer if we read the definition carefully we can find three important factors in this definition which mean which makes an activity as an offer first one is expression of willingness where there is expression of willingness second there is another person another person to whom the offer is made and third one is to get the assent of the other person that means in the offer if these three points are present that means expression of willingness another person and the assent of the other person 
that means that we can call it as an offer further there are two parties involved in an offer the person who offers is called as offerer and the person to whom the offer is made is known as offeree there are two types of an offer one is the specific offer second one is a general offer specific offer is that offer in which the offer is made to a definite person or a group of persons when the offer is only for that specific group of persons or an individual that is called an specific offer but when there is an offer for whole of the world that is called as an general offer let's take an example to differentiate the both uh, there uh, mr a has some property he wants to sell it if mr a offers to mr b that uh, if if mr a offers to mr b that do you want to purchase my property at this price this is a specific offer and this specific offer can be accepted by only mr b and in case of the same property if this offer is uh, made through the advertisement in the newspaper mr a gives the advertisement in the newspaper that i have a property and if anyone is willing to purchase can contact me so this type of offer when is given in the newspaper this type of offer is called as the general offer and this offer can be accepted by any person in the whole world that means in short when the offer is made to some specific per person and can be accepted by only that person is known as the specific offer when the offer is made to the whole world not to a specific person or a body of persons then it is called as a general offer now uh, there are some essentials of a valid offer first is offer must be communicated to the other party the first essential of the valid offer says that till the offer is communicated to the other party this is not a valid offer uh, let's take an example uh, mr a has uh, mr a uh, mr a has a property he want to sell it to mr b and he he has written this in a piece of paper and after writing this he has kept this paper into his drawer he has never conveyed to mr b that he wants to um, sell his property to mr b that means the offer is not communicated to mr b in this case this is not a valid offer in, in this context we can discuss the case of lalman shukla versus gauridat what happened in this case d sent his servant p to find his missing nephew d, uh, d is a owner and b and p is his servant and uh, his uh, d's nephew is missing and he sent his servant to find him and uh, when p goes to find him and after him uh, d announces a reward that any person who will find my missing nephew i will give reward to that person and in absence of this announcement what the servant do servant find the nephew and brings him back and because he never knows that there is a reward offered by the uh, offered by d he has never claimed it but later on he came to know that mr d has announced some reward for the missing boy and he come to mr d and asks for that reward and in this case then d said that because the uh, d said that because he was not communicated he never knows at the time when the offer was made he was totally unaware of the offer and he has found the missing boy but offer was never being communicated to that person so he can't claim the reward in that case so this case of lalman shukla versus gauridat clearly states that when the offer is not communicated to the other party this is not a valid offer and in this case lalman shukla versus gauridat servant the servant can't claim any kind of reward from his owner second thing is offer must be made to obtain the consent of the offeree the offer once made the purpose of making the offer should be to obtain the consent of offeree when the purpose is not that to obtain the consent this is never the valid offer we can discuss this in case of harris versus nickerson in this case uh, mr n 
gave a gave an advertisement in the newspaper that he wants to sell his goods at a particular place on a particular date and by listening this mr h traveled a long distance and came there at came at the place of the sale of goods but by coming there he came to know that the sale of goods is not there it is being cancelled and he sued to mr n that he has traveled a lot and he is he has come to the place but the sale is not there so so his travel distances must be recovered by mr n and in this case court said that this offer was never made to obtain the consent of the offeree and this was given in the newspaper this was totally an ad offer never made to obtain the consent of mr h so in this case mr h cannot claim the travel distance charges from mr n so it the case makes it very clear that the offer must be made to obtain the consent of the offeree now we move to the third point that is it must have definite and clear terms what i mean from definite and clear terms let's take the example if i say that uh, give me certain sum of money so when i say give me certain sum of money certain sum of money may be for me is rupees 100 and for you it may be rupees 1000 and for another it may be rupees 10000 so the term which i am using that must be very definite and clear in case uh, in case of an offer but in absence of the definite terms and the clear terms the offer cannot be a valid offer and this can be well explained with the case of the taylor versus pottington in the case of taylor versus pottington in the case of taylor versus pottington uh, a agreed to uh, take b's house on rent uh, for pound 85 per annum but the house should be properly repaired and drawing room should be decorated according to present style here the term according to present style doesn't have a clear meaning for both the parties because one party when says according to present style may have some different kind of scenario in 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 his mind whereas the other person who is listening to this term may think it otherwise so in this case it is very clear ki this is not a valid offer when we say that uh, the drawing room should be according to the present style so to make a offer to make an offer a valid offer the terms should be definite and clear next we come to capable of creating legal relationship as i have already discussed the case of welfare versus welfare where the relationship in that case was totally domestic the court has denied that mr welfer is not responsible to pay to mrs welfer because they have never intended a legal relationship for that money so the same case can be uh, applied here that means when the offer is made to create a legal relationship only then the offer is a valid offer next point is Uh, the offer must express the final willingness of the offerer when we say ki the the offer is made so the offer must be made to get the final willingness of the offer the intention of the offerer should be the same to get the final willingness not to try on the more options next we come to the next uh, sixth point offer may be positive or negative if the offerer says i will do this this is a positive offer if the offer is made i would not do this i am not willing to say i am not willing to sell i am not willing to purchase if this kind of offer is made this type of offer is known as negative offer next point is it may be express or implied offer what we mean by the express offer as i have explained in kinds of contract that there are express contracts as well as the implied contracts in the express contract what happened one person offers like for example mr a says i am offering you to purchase my building for rupees 50000 this is very clear expressly uh, expressly expressed uh, expressed offer in words that means it is a express offer but when the offer is clear from the behavior of the person that kind of offer is known as the implied offer 
नेक्स्ट वी कम टू एन इन्विटेशन टू ऑफर इज नॉट एन ऑफर इट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू डिफ्रेंशिएट बिटवीन द ऑफर एंड एन इन्विटेशन टू ऑफर एन इन्विटेशन टू ऑफर इज टोटली डिफरेंट फ्रॉम एन ऑफर लेट्स टेक एन एग्जाम्पल इफ सम गुड्स आर डिस्प्लेड इन द स्टोर एंड दे आर बींग टैग्ड विद द प्राइस टैग्स दैट मीन्स दिस इज an invitation to offer that the customer comes and ask for the good to the owner and then it would be uh, depending upon the uh, response of the owner that to accept that offer or not that means when the price uh, when the displaying of goods is there or some price lists are there by seeing that someone is going to make an offer that is that would be an offer but just the display of goods or giving some price lists that is not an offer that is always an invitation to offer <clears throat> next we come to the lapse of an offer what is the lapse of an offer lapse of an offer means when the offer lapses it is over so there are a few cases when the offer can lapse among all those cases the first case is when the uh, the offerer or the offeree dies before the offer is acceptance either the offerer dies or the offer offerer dies means one of the party has died that means there is a lapse of an offer second is when the uh, acceptance is not given in the specified time for example the offerer has made uh, i am i am offering my um, my car to sell by monday and if anybody is willing if mr if it is a specific of offer or the general offer if anybody is willing can contact me by monday if the monday is over that means the specified time is over uh, specified time is over that means this is a lapse of an offer and third point is when the acceptance uh, is not and um, not a valid acceptance we will read in the further slides that what is the meaning of the valid acceptance when the of acceptance is not given given in a desired mode or the acceptance is not given in a specified time period means when the acceptance is not a valid acceptance that means this is uh, this is a lapse of an offer and last by the revocation of an offer by any means if the offer is revocated that means the there is a lapse of an offer and once the offer is lapsed it is not a valid offer next hai an offer may be conditional uh, an offer may be conditional means when the offer is made a few conditions can be attached to that offer and that um, conditions must also be communicated to the offeree when the offer is being communicated let's take an example i will take this i am willing to purchase this house if the house is repaired that means only a house would be purchased if the condition is that if the house is repaired and this is being communicated to the offeree also that means if the repair is not there this offer would not be accepted that means what i want to convey here is offer may be conditional offer may be given with at some attached conditions and offeree is to accept if the offeree accepts the offer he has to abide by all the conditions attached we have read 10 points which makes an offer a valid offer now we come to the second component of the first point that is the acceptance but before that let's discuss the revocation as i said the under the lapse of an offer the offer can be revocated Re, ha, un, un, uh, section 6 as i said uh, under the lapse of an offer that the offer can be lapsed by the revocation section 6 explains it in detail how the offer can be revocated the first one is notice of revocation if the offerer wants to revocate the offer he can give the notice to the offeree that i am revocating the offer and by this way by by this notice the offer can be revocated next is the lapse of time once the time is the time given by the offerer to the offeree is lapsed the offer will be revocated second uh, third death or insanity in case of death of offerer the offer can be the offer is totally revocated next hai counter offer what is the counter offer 
I will give first its example. It would be clear by that. Uh, for example, Mr. A said to Mr. B that I, uh, I offer my mobile to you to purchase for rupees 1000. And Mr. B said, uh, I would not purchase it for 1000. I am ready to pay rupees 950. And for that, this is the counter offer. That means the first offer of rupees 1000 is being revocated. And now the new offer is being made by Mr. A for rupees 950. The original offer made by Mr. A is revocated. That means the offer in, uh, in answer of the offer is known as the counter offer. And when the counter offer is made, the original offer is considered to be revocated. Next here, non-fulfillment of condition precedent. Uh, as, we re as we have read that the offer may be a conditional offer. If the offer is a conditional offer and the condition, precedent condition is not fulfilled, uh, as I have given the example that I would like to purchase your house, I am ready to purchase your house if the house is repaired. So that means if the repair is done, the offer is valid offer, but if the repair is not done, the precedent condition was repair of house. If the repair of house is not done, the offer is revocated. That means non-fulfillment of conditional precedent will make the offer revocated. Last is a subsequent illegality. Any condition which makes the things illegal subsequently will revocate the original offer. Next, we come to the second component of the first point that is the acceptance. What is the acceptance? Section 2B defines the acceptance as when the person to whom the proposal is made signify his assent thereto, the proposal is said to be accepted. A proposal when accepted becomes a promise. That means the person to whom the offer was made the main important thing, the offer can be accepted by only that person to whom the proposal was made. And the, the other important thing here involved is the person has given his assent to the same thing for which the offer was made. Let's take an example. Mr. A has two cars. Uh, let's take Mr. Uh, white car and uh, black car. Mr. A said, I offer to Mr. B to purchase my car for rupees 10,000. And Mr. B said, yes, I am ready to purchase. He gave his acceptance. But now what happened? Mr. A, when offered, was thinking of white car. But when Mr. Uh, Mr. B has accepted the offer, he was thinking of black car. That means there is a difference in the thought process of both offerer and the offeree. So this kind of acceptance can't be considered as, a, uh, as an acceptance because they were thinking on the different things. They were not on the same track. So the acceptance must be given on the same thing for which the offer was made. Now the type of acceptance, uh, it can be expressed, it can be implied. As already explained, when the things are being done when by words, either spoken or written. This is an express acceptance. Implied, let's take an example. Uh, when, one, when one boards to the bus, that means he is accepting the offer to pay the rent of the, to pay the uh, cost of that traveling to the other party. That means this is shown from the behavior of the person that he is ready to pay. This kind of acceptance is known as the implied acceptance. Next, we come to essentials of a valid acceptance. When an acceptance can be said that this is a valid acceptance. First is acceptance must be communicated. As the offer was necessary to be communicated, at the same time, acceptance must also be communicated. Let's take an example. Mr. A offers his car to Mr. B and this was communicated to Mr. B. Now what Mr. B did? Mr. B has accepted the offer. He has written, written in, a, in a letter and keep that letter and kept that letter into his drawer and he has never posted his acceptance to, acceptance to the offerer Mr. A. Now this offer, this offer is being accepted but, but this acceptance is never been communicated. So this acceptance can never be said that this is a valid acceptance. 
second is acceptance must be communicated to the offerer himself if the acceptance is given to someone else other than the offerer this would not be a valid acceptance third point is acceptance must be absolute and unqualified that means any acceptance which is not absolute not unqualified can't be said that it is a valid acceptance it is totally clear from the case of hide versus wrench in this case a uh, defendant offers to sell his farm house for pound 1000 and the uh, and the plaintiff want to purchase that farm house for for pound 950 and later on he agreed that he would pay uh, pay pound 1000 to the defendant and now the defendant refused to sell the property and the uh, the plaintiff has filed a suit that he was ready to give me now but he is not ready to give me it now uh, at present then the court decided that the case the acceptance was acceptance should be unqualified and absolute but in this condition acceptance was not absolute and unqualified so this case can't be sued that means when we talk about the acceptance must be absolute and unqualified that means that it should be without conditions without reservations and without any variations in the terms given by the offerer next is it must be in prescribed manner when the offerer said that if anybody is willing can call me and the if the acceptance is given in the written form this is not a prescribed manner in which the acceptance was demanded and if the acceptance is given in some different manner as asked by the offerer this can never be called as a valid acceptance next is acceptance must be given in time period described time period if the offerer says that i offer my car to sell by monday only that means if the monday is the monday is over there there can't be any acceptance if if any acceptance comes after monday this can't be considered as a valid acceptance next is the acceptor must be aware about the offer at the time of offer when the offer was made the acceptor must be known to this fact as we have already discussed the case of lalman shukla versus gauri dat in which the servant was not aware about that any offer is made in his absence and later on when he claimed about the reward announced by his owner the court said that he can't uh, he can't demand the reward as well as it is the duty of the servant to serve the owner that means the acceptor was not about not aware about the offer when the offer was made so so in that case also it is being proved that when the acceptor is not aware about the offer at the time of the offer this is not a valid acceptance next is acceptance cannot be implied from silence for example mr a said that Uh, if you do, if i don't hear anything from you till monday i would assume that you have accepted the offer this is not a valid acceptance reason being any acceptance implied from silence can't be a valid acceptance only it can be expressed or it can be implied as we have discussed already next is acceptance must be given before the lapse of an offer as till now we all know when the offer is lapsed i repeat on the death of the either of the party on the revocation or some other conditions so when the offer is lapsed any acceptance given after the lapse of the offer is never a valid acceptance next point is the acceptor the acceptance must show an intention that acceptor is willing to fulfill the term if any kind of behavior of the acceptor shows that he is not willing to fulfill the terms this is not a valid acceptance for example the acceptor has given uh, his acceptance in 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 a joking mode or there is no legal relationship between the two parties so in this case this shows that the acceptor is not willing to fulfill the terms so this means this can never be a valid acceptance so by now we have discussed that the first 
the first component of section 10 of Indian Contract Act 1872 says that there should be a valid offer and valid acceptance for making a contract a valid contract. Now we move to the second point that is a legal relationship. So there should be an intention to create a legal relationship in a contract. If the intention is not that, not to create a legal relationship, it can never be known as a valid contract. So for that, there are three conditions to be fulfilled. One, an agreement must create legal relationships. Any agreement which creates to the domestic relationship is not a legal relationship. Agreements of social and domestic nature do not contemplate legal relationships. Any agreement which goes for the social or domestic nature, for example, as we discussed welfare versus welfare case in which there was totally a domestic uh, domestic nature of relationship between uh, Mr. Welfare and Mrs. Welfare to pay for the living of Mrs. Welfare uh, pound 30 per month. So that was court considered that this was totally a domestic nature of relationship. This can never be a valid contract. Third is agreements which give rise to moral obligations do not create legal obligations. In the situations where there is a moral obligation of one of the party to serve the other one, there is no legal relationship so there is no valid contract. And in this context, you can quote always the case of Mrs., uh, Mr. and Mrs. Welfare. So this is the second point under which the court says that if you want to make any contract a valid contract, there must be an intention to create a legal relationship or there should be a legal relationship between the two parties. So this is over with today's lecture. Let me summarize what we have discussed. First is introduction to Indian Contract Act 1872. Second meaning and definition of the contract we have done. Under the elements of contract, we have discussed the different elements that is uh, agreement and enforceability at law. Under the kinds of contract we have divided, we have uh, differentiated the types of contract on the three different bases. Under the uh, essentials of a valid contract, as I have explained, there are 10 elements and under this part one of the essentials of valid contract, we have discussed the two various components, offer and acceptance and the legal relationship. Thank you.